Welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Hugh Hewitt. I am the President, CEO, and General Counsel of the Nixon Foundation. Uh, welcome to the East Room. We're very excited about the conversation we're about to have. We are going to um, delve into technology and its intersection with our democracy in the world. And I really can't think of anyone better to do this with than Brad Smith. I taped an interview with Brad this morning, which will air Monday on my radio show, if any of you want to hear even more of this. Brad is the president of Microsoft. He is also the chief legal officer of Microsoft. He is also leading Microsoft philanthropies. And for years on Friday, a small group of Microsoft executives gather in the C-suite and they talk through every single problem the company is presented with. And for years and years, Brad Smith has been in that meeting and now he has taken that with the excellent assistance of his co-writer, Carol Brown, who's sitting right here. Carol, would you stand up and let us give you a hurrah? He is joining us. I, I, I can't tell you how happy we are to have him. Please welcome Brad Smith. We're gonna go for 45 minutes, so I'm gonna go fast. I recommend to you Tools and Weapons. I read it in uh, three days, and I'm showing in my annotated copy I have. We could talk for five hours, but I'm not gonna do that. I am gonna start, though, with a question I told him on the air this morning I was gonna start with. What about Warren? And by that I mean, I'm from Warren, Ohio. It's sort of like, how, is this good for the Jews? Jews always ask that. What about Warren? The technology industry, as you write, has created extraordinary economic imbalances in the country. Is the tech industry going to do anything about the Erie Pennsylvanias, the Detroit Michigans, the Warren Ohios, the places that have not benefited by this extraordinary economic expansion? Well, it's a great question, Hugh. I, I will tell you a secret. When I was on the radio show this morning and he, he said, what about Warren? My first reaction was, you mean Elizabeth? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what's she got? We to may do get this? to her, yes. Yeah. Um, but first, it's it's fantastic to be here. Thank and you. To be here with you, and I think that the question, "What about Warren, Ohio?" is a great question. Uh, it's one that I think about because I grew up in Appleton, Wisconsin. It's something that Carol Ann, my co-author, thinks about because she grew up in El Paso, Texas, and it's frankly a question that everybody who doesn't live on one of the coasts asks all the time. And one of the points that we make in our book is that in many ways, technology has exacerbated many of the other divides in this country, sometimes in urban America, oftentimes in more rural America. Um, one of our favorite chapters, one of the stories that we share is visiting Ferry County, Washington State. It's a county in the eastern part of the state. One of the reasons we went there is because it always has the highest unemployment rate in Washington State. And what is interesting about it is that when you get there, one of the things you realize is that there is no broadband. Uh, the largest employer in Ferry County is a lumber mill with 176 employees, which until two months ago was trying to run the entire business with a single copper telephone line that had probably about 10% of the bandwidth that you have into your home here in Southern California. Imagine trying to serve 176 people with that. And what it really causes you to reflect upon is that in our view, broadband is the electricity of the 21st century. It is the future of education, the future of medicine, and perhaps most especially, the future of jobs. You just cannot persuade a business to go open a factory or to expand a facility if it can't have broadband. And then there's one other thing that we mention as well. When you go to Ferry County, Washington, when you sit down as we did for lunch at the Naughty Pine Diner, what you meet is a group of people that knows full well that the Federal Communications Commission in Washington, D.C., for years, has put out reports that says that everyone who lives in Ferry County already has broadband. And hence, they never qualify for any of the $8 billion the federal government is spending every year to bring broadband to places that supposedly don't have it. And then you ask, why do people 
not have confidence in their government. It's because their government actually doesn't understand the conditions in which they live. And one of the conditions that actually matters deeply to people is whether they have access to technology. Well, is there within the tech community a commitment to meet together in the Gang of 500? And there are. When you describe President Xi coming to the country, 28 companies, I thought to myself, okay, 20 people in 28 companies, they actually run the tech industry. Do they ever get together in a council of 500 like Athens and decide, we need to put a data center in Warren, we need to put a data center in Milwaukee, Wisconsin? Do they ever think this way? I think that, first of all, people in the tech sector are starting to spend more time coming together and asking these broader questions. I think that's a good thing, and I think we have a long ways to go to get where we need to get. Um, I do think that we need to do more to get ourselves into these local communities. Um, part of it is the construction of data centers. It's why I'm excited that Microsoft's big data centers are in places like Cheyenne, Wyoming or Quincy, Washington, or Boynton, Virginia. Um, you know, they're not, by and large, in downtown Chicago or in Manhattan, and they never will be, given the amount of space that these enormous data center campuses require, literally millions of square feet for hundreds of thousands of computers. But that's just scratching the surface. Uh, one of the programs that we launched as a company two years ago is called TechSpark. And basically, what we did is we sat down and you know, we asked ourselves what I think a lot of Americans asked themselves. How did Donald Trump win this election? <laughs> no, it, let's face it, it was a surprise. And it was a surprise because when you looked across the electoral map of the United States, you actually saw a small number of very populated counties that were blue and a map that is mostly red. And you know, living in a blue county, Seattle, Washington, King County, you couldn't help but conclude, you know what, I think there's a lot of people who are looking at the country different from the people who are our neighbors. How are we gonna understand their point of view and what technology means to them? So we created this program and said, you know what, we're gonna invest deeply in six communities outside the coast. And by some sort of coincidence, and not completely, one of them is El Paso, another is Appleton and Green Bay, Wisconsin. But it's, it's spread across the The third one will the be country. Warren, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, if we had talked at the right time, we would have been in Warren, Ohio. And, but what, the first thing we did is we hired somebody locally yeah. to manage the TechSpark program. We focused on things like technology and education, access to coding, initiatives to promote job growth, support for the nonprofit community. And what we really said is, let's go learn more, because we have a lot to learn, but let's try to turn our learning then into initiatives to actually figure out you know, how could you turn technology into a force that would promote job growth in these areas. It's one of the things that then inspired us to take on broadband as a national cause. We created a program called Airband and said, you know what, we're gonna bring, air, air, we're gonna bring broadband ourselves to at least three million people who don't have it by 2022, but our real goal is to build a market that closes the broadband gap. But these are the questions people need to ask. I think it's like anything in life. You only get to the right answers if you ask the right questions. Therefore, it's actually a lot more important to figure out the questions than to first sit down with answers. One of the most riveting for the political junkie out there segments of the book is when you and Carol describe the post-election debrief you did of both the Democrats and the Republicans. They sat down with Brad Parscale, they sat down with Robbie Mook, they asked them, what did you do right, what did you do wrong, and because you are Microsoft and you're kind of neutral, you're not caught yet in this branding as red or blue, they talked to you. Would you summarize what you found, because I think no matter what people's politics are, that the Republicans leapt over the Democrats in that short space of time amazed me. And by the way, I was at NBC that night, and I was probably the only person at 30 Rock who voted for Donald Trump. I sat over in the corner by myself, I was quiet. But it was a, they were stunned. They were absolutely stunned. But what did your debrief show that I've read in Tools and Weapons? Well, it was fascinating because we did have meetings with each group, of course, separately. Uh, you know, <laughs> 
Yeah, because we wanted to have a candid conversation and, and really understand, as a post-mortem, how did each campaign use technology? And the conventional wisdom across the board in 2016 was that Hillary Clinton had the unsurpassed technology and data machine. No one could rival her. And what we concluded was that it really, most, the biggest share of the credit should go to Reince Priebus, in my view. What the Republican National Committee did between 2012 and 2016 was build this huge uh, database that federated data from super PACs and other candidates and you know, nonprofit groups and the like. And the reason they did it, is, as we explain in the book, is because they didn't know who would be the nominee. Uh, and so they had to have data that would appeal to any issue that might be of interest to whoever got the Republican nomination. Uh, so they thought about data differently. They weren't hyper-focused on just one set of issues. And then when Donald Trump got the nomination, it was July, there wasn't that much time. He didn't try to replicate what the RNC had already built. He said, how do we use what is here and then have Brad Parscale basically use Facebook and other services to go on top of it and reach voters in new ways? And the other thing that was just so fascinating was as they got to the last couple weeks of the election, they did something that to some degree I think was a little unconventional. They said, look, we have a database of about 700,000 people that don't say they want to vote for Donald Trump, but based on everything we know about the issues, if they go to the polls, we think they will. Let's put all of our energy in these battleground states in getting these folks to vote. And so that's what they did. And they continued to constantly uh, test their algorithms in a way that I think the Clinton campaign did not, and therefore they saw the trends start to move, especially in, in Michigan, even in Wisconsin, where no one uh, was, was seeing it. And when it was all said and done, you know, we, we, we listened to both groups, and then as we talk about in the book, I asked the Microsoft team there, who had the better data operation, Clinton or Trump? The vote was unanimous it was Donald Trump. Uh, and, and it was just fascinating, and, and it just speaks to, I think, the point that you make, Hugh, never assume that your technology leadership position is going to be sustained. Never take it for granted. There was no doubt, in our view, that in 2012, Barack Obama had a stronger data and technology operation than Mitt Romney. Everybody thought, going into 2016, that the Democrats would sustain that advantage. They did not. In Tools and Weapons, at the end of it, I tried to summarize for myself the three takeaways that I will remember. And they are that the three critical problems in technology today is the extremist individual, the rogue state, and rogue AI. And the most important of those is the rogue state because they can pretend to be an extremist individual and they might unleash rogue AI. So I'd like to deal with them last and begin with the extremist individual. You identify Microsoft having nine different platforms that are susceptible to the use of extremists of any sort. Uh, how large is the problem? And I'm so glad to see that you brought up Minority Report because in a small dinner with a senior tech executive, so did I and some of my colleagues laughed. And I said, well, can't you find these people before they create havoc? And the answer was, no, we can't do that yet. But what do you do about the extremist individual? Well, first of all, I think you're right to identify it as one of the issues that we need to focus on. One of the, I think, defining moments for technology in 2019 is what the industry and governments have done to work together since the Christchurch terrorist attack in March. And you might ask, well, why is that the attack that was the galvanizing force? And there were two reasons. The first is even in a time when you know, we read all too often about mass shootings, there was something quite different about the terrorist attack in Christchurch, New Zealand on the 15th of March. It's the first attack we had ever seen that really used the internet as a stage. The terrorist who was from Australia came to New Zealand and he live streamed the entire thing on Facebook. And he planned in advance so that those videos would be available and then be changed 
and then re-uploaded as they were millions of times, especially on YouTube and on Facebook, as well as on a service to in the hundreds rather than the thousands or millions like LinkedIn that Microsoft owns and operates. That's the first reason it was different. The second reason it was different was because of one person, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern. You might remember the images of her going to these mosques and really you know, consoling the families. There were 51 people who were killed that day. Uh, and uh, Carol Ann and I, by coincidence, were in Wellington, the capital of New Zealand, 12 days after that attack. And Prime Minister Ardern asked us to come meet with her. We had no idea what to expect. She had taken a very strong stand against tax tech platforms. So we, we came to her office at 5.30 in the evening, and it's one of those things where you wonder, you know, is this our turn to go to the woodshed, so to speak? Um, but she invited us in. She basically had half of the government cabinet sitting around a table. She asked me to sit next to her, and she said, look, I don't want to score PR points. That would be easy for a politician to do. I want to talk about whether there is some way we could do something that would make a difference and make it harder for somebody to do to other people what this person did in Christchurch. So we talked about it, and we sort of developed this idea of bringing governments and tech companies together to put in place some, some new rules around access to live streaming that would get the tech sector to, to share technology tools to help startups address this problem, uh, that would create a crisis incident protocol so that when one of these things happens, information can go quickly and we can make sure that people are not using the internet to spread violence in this way. And she did this amazing job, and it, I've never actually seen a foreign ministry work the way the New Zealand government has in the months since. They mobilized their ambassadors around the world. We had the chance to work with them. Two months to the day after that terrorist attack, 17 governments came together in Paris to sign what's called the Christchurch Call, which really then embodies the standards to try to keep people safe against this kind of extremism. Last week in New York at the UN General Assembly, that had grown to 50 governments. And so you're seeing real steps being taken. And I, I think it is, first of all, a powerful reminder of the point I think you're making. Unfortunately, in the world today, a lone individual can have an outsized impact. And the good news is if we do a better job of working together, we can be more effective in combating it. Let me ask you about my favorite hobby horse, anonymity. Uh, the, the highways outside, anyone can ride on them, but to drive on them you need a license and you must have a license plate on your car. Why do you think technology allows people to post who are anonymous, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook? Ought we not to require people to put their name, at least in a way that's accessible? They might be able to remain anonymous, but when they get their privileges, we ought to be able to find who they are. It it first goes to one of the first design decisions that was made in the invention of the internet. And it is a classic example of the fact that your first decisions can just ripple for decades. Think about how the telephone system was designed in this country and every other one. You can't make a phone call without having a telephone number. So it was always possible to trace a call back to the caller. In our day, we saw caller ID. The internet was designed so it could be used anonymously, and it was considered a feature, not a bug. Right. People were proud of this for lots of you know, e interesting and even important reasons. But it has led to the kinds of anonymity that has facilitated the weaponization of technology. So I think the question then becomes, is this something that we want to continue to permit, at least in every way that it can be pursued today? And from our perspective, we think the answer in some respects should be no. Um, an example, you know, is some good ideas that we applaud in the book from Senator Mark Warner from Virginia. He basically says, look, it's one thing to post things on the internet, but when we have Russians posting things or Iranians, we released actually a report this morning at Microsoft about Iranian attacks that we're seeing against politicians and even a US presidential campaign. When you are seeing technology used in this way, 
We ought to impose control so it's clear what country a post is coming from. You can do that. It's clear whether it's a human being or a bot that's doing the posting. In other instances, we, I think, should explore requiring you know, you know, uh, the source. Think about what we do with political advertising in the United States. We don't try to regulate what people say. We know that there's going to be an argument about whether it's true or false. But every political ad ends the same way. It's something, somebody talking really fast, but saying who they are, who paid for the ad. So I, I do think that there are at least areas where we can explore trying to make it clear when you read something, who it is who's speaking, and then you can factor that in as you evaluate what you're reading or watching. Let me turn then to rogue AI. One of the funny lines is nobody wants to wake up in the morning to find a war has begun by a machine. And made me think of war games and some of the classic issues about technology run rampant. And you talked about how North Korea even included kill switch in their virus. Are there kill switches everywhere? Reassure those of us who are aware of the problem that it's under control. Um, or not. I, I, well, you know, it, this, this is a really interesting question to put in the perspective of 2019. What was the biggest technology disaster so far this year? Well, certainly one that is in the running was the software that didn't work properly in the, air, oh. in the cockpit of an aircraft. And so then you ask yourself a pretty simple but fundamental question. When technology isn't working right, what do you always need to be able to do? You need to be able to turn it off. So in software, that might be called a kill switch. It is a way for people remotely to do something that will stop the software from running. For most of us, it's like, look, just show me the on-off switch so I can push it and turn the darn thing off. And I do think that it is an incredibly powerful uh, you know, focus for us as we continue to create technology. You know, we, we talk in the book about the ethical principles that we think need to guide artificial intelligence. The most important of which I think is that technology needs to work and be accountable to people. And it cannot work that way unless we can actually turn it off when it's not working the way we want. And I think it's a lesson for all of us in the tech sector to think more about I think there are a lot of kill switches, but you know, maybe not as many as we need. You just mentioned your ethics committee. It was curious to me. You described the ethics committee that governs artificial intelligence, and I made a margin note. I wonder who's on it. I wonder if they have an Archbishop Chaput or an Archbishop Gomez leading Catholic, brilliant conservatives who are also uh, leaders of the poor and the dispossessed. Do you have on it Robbie George from Princeton, or is it just techies talking to techie, or are you really out there looking for diverse views of the moral order? Well, we're definitely looking for diverse views. Um, and I think the first aspect of diversity one needs is actually people who are not engineers, data scientists, and computer scientists, but rather people who come from the humanities, the social scientists, the worlds of philosophy and religion. I think you can bring those folks into your company in a variety of different ways. Um, we have at Microsoft Research one of the, probably the largest basic research uh, uh, commercial enterprise in the world. I would argue it's the, the counterpart of what Bell Labs, Bell Labs. had yeah. you know, 60 or 70 years ago. It has 1,200 employees who have PhDs. 800 of them are in computer science. But it has sociologists, it has philosophers, it has ethicists, you know, it has economists. So you, you, you have to get folks into your company and make sure that they have a seat at the table every day. Second, I do think you need these advisory groups, and we have them. We don't go out and trumpet, here's our advisory group, and look at all the people who are on it, because we actually just want to hear people's views. Um, you know, Google created an, uh, an advisory group uh, uh, around AI, uh, and it literally lasted less than a week um, because they published all the names, and then people got upset. Well, that person we don't like, this other person we don't like, and, and mostly we're like, look, we just want to hear people's ideas. 
Um, so we just sit down, and I you know, have a couple of different ones that I meet with once. One of them meets once a quarter, the other meets twice a year. But I think there's no substitute actually to going to where people are. I agree. And not just bringing people in. And that's why you know it's not just going to you know, the rural communities of this country or in other places, as we share in the book. It's why we go to the Vatican to talk about artificial intelligence and ethics. Um, it's why we go to people who are practicing other religions in other countries. It's why we sit down with people who represent different philosophies. It doesn't mean that we're ever going to agree with everybody. Nobody ever agrees with everybody. But if you listen to people, you learn from them, you always come away with a breadth of perspective that I think is badly needed in the world of technology. Let's turn to nation states. And I put them into two categories when we talk about rogue states. It's Russia, Iran, North Korea, and the not lamented physical caliphate that lives on online. And then there's China, which I will come to separately. To the first four, yeah. ought they not to be cut off from and shunned by the world of technology, because they are bad actors, they are evil actors on the world stage? Well, it's a very interesting question, and it's, it, I think it's fascinating to put the four in the category that you do. Um, you know, the first thing we do is, is think not only about what's right from our vantage point as a company, but what is the national policy and even the law of the United States. And, you know, the United States clearly puts North Korea and, you know, what is left of ISIS in one category, and basically does seek to deprive them uh, uh, with access to American technology. Um, and you know, we, of course, respect that. The truth is you know, we're supporting the United Nations in its prosecution of ISIS. Uh, and we do battle every day with North Korea um, because we see the attacks uh, that they are launching and we work actively to disrupt them and even to fight back when we can do so in an appropriate way as we have with North Korea. Um, you get to the, the, the next two, uh, Russia and Iran. Um, and you know, uh, Iran is basically off limits. Russia is not in terms of American law and the ability to buy US technology. One of the things we talk about you know, in a way where we really try to be quite candid in the book is the challenges we face in Russia. Um, because you know, in the world today, there's two groups connected with the Russian government, uh, one connected with uh, the Russian military in particular, uh, that has been the source of constant uh, and very sophisticated attacks. Attacks against American politicians and think tanks. Uh, as we've tracked it, actually attacks on 70 nations around the world. Uh, and you know, we have customers in Russia. I think it's good that we give them the opportunity to run their business, I'll say, on, on, the, on the basis of American technology. Uh, but we're very careful not to put data in data centers in, in Russia. We're very careful uh, you know, not to run consumer services that would put human rights at risk. LinkedIn is not available in Russia. Um, and you know, we have constant diplomatic challenges. We share some of the stories uh, about you know, the pushback that we get, that some of it you know, that I've gotten. Uh, you know, from the Russian government. So, you know, it, it's, it, it is, it, it's not what businesses are built to deal with. When you start a company, you go, oh, I'm gonna, you know, go deal with this today in Russia. No, it's, you know, that's not why you build a business, but it's what we've been thrust uh, in, into dealing with. And, you know, increasingly we're seeing the same thing or at least something similar from Iran. And it's why we spoke out uh, actually publicly just a few hours ago um, you know, to talk about just since August this upsurge that we've seen in activity coming from a group connected with the Iranian government that we see targeting American politicians. The IRGC is an agent of evil in the world. I spend a lot of time studying the IRGC, and I'm glad to hear you have that response. Let's turn before we run out of my time to China. I want to quote to you Graham Allison from the, um, his most recent book on whether or not war is inevitable between China and Iran, talking about the Thucydides trap. He interviewed the late Lee Kuan Yew who ran Singapore. You probably got to meet Lee Kuan Yew at some point, or, or Bill Gates did, saying to him, quote, the size of China's displacement of the world balance is such that the world must find a new balance. It is not possible to pretend that this is just another big player. This is the biggest player 
in the history of the world. And Graham Allison lays out the statistical facts for the fact a nation of 1.4 billion is going to be larger and more significant than a nation of 330 million. What is Microsoft doing? Because they have what they call uh, national security with Chinese characteristics, it's ended up with a million Uyghurs in concentration camps. Well, it is, I think, a, a question of profound importance and enormous complexity. Uh, and we devote a chapter in our book to the U.S.-China relationship, and it was the hardest chapter for us to write. Um, it is just, you know, it, it, we, we've entered a world where, as we put it, it's a bipolar technology world. There are two capitals of technology. One is the west coast of the United States, and the other is the east coast of, of, of China. Um, and we're going to have to think this through as a nation in terms of how we remain economically competitive and successful in the future. We start with the premise that artificial intelligence will be as important to the next three decades of the global economy as, say, the combustion engine was to the first half of the 20th century. In fact, we talk about how the transition from the horse to the automobile changed every part of the economy. AI will as well. We talk about the fact that AI is driven by access to data. Data uh, is produced by people. A country with 1.4 billion people inevitably will produce far more data than a country of 330 million. Uh, we talk about how we think we need to be rooted in common values and really ensure that the United States works closely with, with Western Europe, with the Western Hemisphere, with countries like Japan and South Korea. And when you think about the world in those terms, if we can commit ourselves to ensuring that technology works in accord with some common values, then you start to see how the United States can have a long-term effective strategy. I think being here, to be honest, reminds me of something else. Yeah, the truth is, China's been the largest country in the world for 23 centuries, and it's been the most powerful economy for about 21 of those 23 centuries. It's worth reminding ourselves of that. And in addition to quoting Lee Kuan Yew, at least when we're here, we should quote Richard Nixon. When you come here, as we did, and you go on the tour and you see the video, there are two really powerful quotes from President Nixon. One was when he went to Moscow and he signed the first arms control agreement, the START uh, agreement. And you see this video where he says, look, we will be competitors, we may be adversaries, but we need not necessarily be enemies. That's one thing to think about. The other thing is to see what President Nixon said when he went to China. He said, we can't have a stable and enduring peace. That's the phrase he used. We can't have a stable and enduring peace without the participation of the People's Republic of China. I think we want to be economically successful as a nation, and we want to be economically successful for the rest of the 21st century and beyond. And I actually think we do want a stable and enduring peace. Now we have to figure out how to do both. Let's stay on that. Um, Dr. Kissinger, who I was honored to sit down with uh, 10 days ago, spent a couple hours with, calls Nixon in his book on China the pessimistic strategist, a realist about the challenge, but how do we deal with it? Um, I pulled up from, your, uh, from the web today, because I was going to talk to you, the most recent story on Microsoft from the Financial Times. Microsoft worked with Chinese military university on artificial intelligence. Now, being a member of the media, I realize this is probably not correct, and it's probably over, you know, a little bit um, uh, exaggerated for military, but after reading your book, which is so concerned about AI, what happened here? Um, well, the media was uh, only partly correct. Uh, well, what a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, it was interesting. The, no, the Financial Times ran a story a, a couple months ago that talked about researchers from Microsoft Research working with researchers from a particular university in China that basically does the research for the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. 
Uh, and in fact, when we looked into it, what we found was that there were two researchers from Microsoft Research who were on leave from Microsoft. They were working at the University of British Columbia. They worked on a paper that was also co-authored by two professors who were on sabbatical from that university. Um, so it wasn't entirely correct, but you know, it goes back to even if people don't have the right answers, maybe they're asking the right questions. It caused us to go ask ourselves some more questions. And so we did, in fact, um, you know, add to the guidelines and, and processes that govern the work of Microsoft Research so that our folks are actually not doing any work, even when they're on leave, with the faculty or the students or interns from that particular university, because we don't want to be in the business of developing technology for the Chinese military. Now, you are very blunt in Tools and Weapons about the problem that we face on a security side, because the People's Republic of China has IT theft, and, and, and they believe in it as statecraft, and you have to protect yourself against it. But I want to add a parallel problem. Uh, we have great supporters of the Nixon Library who are Chinese Americans, some of whom are victims of the Cultural Revolution, and who have voiced to me concern that there's a new McCarthyism about Chinese Americans in America, that we're becoming paranoid about the People's Republic of China. How does Microsoft, as a multinational but nevertheless very patriotic American company, both worry about the theft but not indulge the McCarthyism? I think you've just raised a really important question, and it's one that I would love to see people talk about a little bit more the way you've raised it in places like Washington, D.C. Um, you know, one of the points that we make in this chapter is, that, at least in our view, it would be a great mistake to try to you know, create a new sort of digital iron curtain down the middle of the Pacific and just say, gee, you know, all contact must stop, people must stop moving back and forth, research collectively should, should discontinue. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm reminded uh, you know, of you know, the recent trip we took to Berlin, and you know, what you recognize is when you know, East Germany built a wall to keep out, so supposedly West Germany, mostly they held themselves back. And I think if the US were to try to stop this kind of interaction in fields like basic science, if you will, basic research, the US would do a lot more to hold itself back than to hold China or anyone else back. Uh, I think we should also recognize that you know, in the world of software, a lot of the work is published. You don't have to be a spy. You just have to read. And there's this thing called the internet that mm. you can search. Um, you know, so you know, I think we have to be careful not to you know, go too far uh, in some of the steps we might take. We need to remember that in the world of software, actually a lot of what we create, the source code is actually published, is open source. Anybody can use it. So you know, there's a lot of nuance. And you know, there are some technologies that are very sensitive from a military perspective, others are not. There are some technologies that are very sensitive from a human rights perspective, others are not. Uh, and you know, we do need to understand the world. We need to understand China. Um, yeah, one, of the, one of the interesting stories we share in the book is when President Xi made his first official trip to the United States as president of China, he actually came first to Seattle. And you know, I'll always remember sitting in this dinner and listening to him speak and you know, listening to him quote all these great American authors that he had studied growing up in China, Hemingway, you know, talking about reading the Federalist Papers. And you, know, you can have your own view of whether he internalized what, what he read and learned, but I think the real question is, are we in the United States learning what we need to learn about China? If you want to navigate the challenges of the world, it actually is really important that we understand them. Right, my last question from me, and then we'll take a couple from the audience. Uh, very recently, Justice Gorsuch was sitting here uh, being interviewed by Matt Parlow, my colleague at Chapman, and he was joking about the tech gap among the clerks and the justices. And you talk about it in Tools and Weapons, and it, it occurred to me, do we need a separate set of courts, and perhaps Article I courts, which are appointed by the, the president without lifetime tenure, but some specialists, like there's a court of claims and a court of international trade, to deal with technology so that the judges who are 
handing down decisions impacting your industry aren't starting from nowhere? I think that would be a mistake. Um, yeah, and yeah, I, I am struck. You know, we, 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 we talk a little bit in the book about, you know, certainly a, 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 a memory that's very vivid to me. I mean, we, we were, Carol Ann, who's sitting in the front row here today, you know, she and I were sitting next to each other in the Supreme Court. You know, for what was the, at the time Microsoft's fourth <coughs> case before the United States Supreme Court. And the cases that involve us that go to the Supreme Court often are really cutting edge technology issues. And you, you go into the Supreme Court, they make you check your phone. You can't bring a laptop, you can't bring any technology into the big courtroom. So you're there to talk about technology and you sit down and the first thing I always do is I look up and there's only really one piece of technology in the Supreme Court. It's huge. It's the clock. <laughs> and I'm like, gee, how are these folks going to deal with this stuff? <laughs> and, and, and you know, I, I, I share the story that I experienced 10 years earlier where you, know, you listen to some of these statements that are made by the justices or, frankly, sometimes the lawyers, and you're going, oh, my gosh, these people... What are they talking about? It's not really our technology, even though they think it is. Mm -hmm. But then this is what you realize, that all of these justices have clerks, the people who've just graduated from law school, they're young, they know the technology. The justices often don't. But these people are pretty wise. Uh, you know, I think it's so fascinating because you know, so many of our modern day views of the Supreme Court are really colored either by the confirmation hearings that have become extraordinarily contentious or a very small number of decisions each year that also are very contentious. But you know, most of the cases that go before the Supreme Court actually call on nine people to sit down around a table and just think about a problem together. Uh, and you know, I've been in a lot of courtrooms around the world. And there's a lot of great courts around the world. I would pick the United States Supreme Court hands down over any court in the world. And I would say that after the contentious controversies of the past couple of years, I would say it despite the fact that justices who might be in their 50s, 60s, 70s, or 80s are not the user of the latest you know, smartphone app. Um, when you can combine wisdom and knowledge with people who can work together, you're going to get it right a lot more than you're not. He's an optimist because he was the first lawyer ever to bring a computer into Foley Square, which is Foley Plaza in New York, where President Nixon's office was when we moved to New York in Foley Plaza. Chris, uh, uh, questions from the audience, please. We do. We have time for a couple of quick questions, uh, and then afterwards we're going to jump into a book signing. We do have copies of the book available in the front lobby. Pick one up. Brad will sign it. Our first question from you in the audience. What is the next big thing in the pipeline for Microsoft? Hmm. Well, you know, it was fascinating because we had a big uh, hardware event just two days ago in New York. Uh, and so we uh, unveiled a number of products, you know, and people, especially in a, you know, for those of us who are consumers, we all are consumers in addition to whatever else we do. You know, it's always the hardware that people focus on. So we have a number of new Surface products, but there were two products that really got people's attention. They'll both ship next year. Um, one is a, a two-screen foldable, a foldable sort of little notebook um, that really, I think, is extraordinarily well designed as uh, you know, a, a little productivity device. Um, you can use it with two screens. You can take notes with a stylus. It has a keyboard that flips over that you can use as well. Uh, the other thing that we showed, which really surprised people, uh, was a new phone. Although I should now correct myself because Panos Panay, who leads our hardware team, said, I know you're going to call it a phone. Yeah. Please don't call it a phone. <laughs> it does make phone calls. I know that at least my kids don't like to use their phone to either make or receive phone calls, but it will work for that. Um, but it, too, is foldable. And so, you know, you can have it shot. You can have half of it. You know, and uh, it's 
a different thing for us. It actually represents a partnership with Google. It runs Android, but it has a lot of Microsoft and apps and productivity uh, offerings on it as well. So I think those will be two really interesting things to see uh, how the market reacts to next year. One more, Chris. An inter interesting question from, Dom, from Bob Donnell. If the leadership from Microsoft and Apple were to switch places, what would be their greatest challenge? Oh, how interesting. Well, I guess I'll, I'll say two things. I mean, first, yeah, anybody who works in the world of technology can't help but respect Apple's singular focus on innovation. Uh, I think they've done a great job. One of the reasons they've been able to do a great job, in my view, is they've actually focused on a relatively, I, don't, I hesitate to say narrow, because you know, once you have the iPhone and a Mac you know, and an iPad, that's pretty broad. But it's still you know, a relatively focused set of products. Um, you know, Microsoft's portfolio is, is far more diversified in terms of you know, everything from an Xbox and gaming to you know, huge cloud services and business uh, services and the like. Um, I think if we at Microsoft went over to Apple, we'd probably you know, find ourselves asking, okay, you know, how do we match what Apple clearly does so well and has done for the last 15 or 20 years and really drive that consumer-facing uh, innovation. I think what the Apple folks would be challenged by is understanding businesses, enterprises, uh, and you know, uh, really understanding uh, a much more diversified portfolio, which is always harder to manage as a business. I will say one other thing that I feel good about at Microsoft, we are trying to engage in really doing at least what we can to address the problems of the world. Um, you know, when there is a problem that involves technology, we don't actually sit down and ask ourselves, well, are we the ones who caused it? If not, let's go home and stay home. We ask ourselves, it doesn't matter whether we caused it, can we help solve it? That was my answer when we were in New Zealand. Jacinda Ardern did not ask to meet with us because Microsoft's services had been used in some fundamental way to spread terror on the internet based on the actions of a terrorist in Christchurch. We just said, gee, this is a problem. I wonder what we can do to help solve this. We'll do what we can. And that I would love to see spread across our industry more broadly. And I'm not going to pick on any specific company, but if any specific company wants to do more to contribute to problem solving, that would be a fantastic day for all of us. Please join me in thanking Brad Smith and Carol Ann Brown. We're going to get him. We're going to get him to the book signing.